Now to the last session, uh, just before lunch, where we're going to talk about uh, uh, radiology and imaging of professional sports injuries and uh, uh, some interesting topics. Uh, uh, what adults asked us to do is basically look into the future and see what the future holds for uh, uh, diagnostic imaging in sports. Now I have all sympathy for uh, Ishan who's kindly swapped with me. He's going to talk about artificial intelligence and uh, he's going to do the talk after me, which is the one just before we break for lunch. So I'm sure uh, even more challenging task of keeping you guys uh, uh, alert and uh, concentrate on the topic. So it's my disclosure. Now as a radiologist, it's really hard to not to show any pictures. Now what I said to myself when I was going to come and uh, do the talk here, because I know a lot of you are uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons, uh, trainees, uh, physios, uh, not very many radiologists. I don't think apart from the two speakers we have any radiologists here. So it's really hard uh, not to show any pictures from a radiology perspective because most of the talks that I do is nothing, there's nothing written, only the imaging uh, aspect of it. But the reason why I still show images is, I put this picture, this says it all. A picture says a thousand words. Especially if you look at the expression of this guy's face, he <laughs> says a lot of things. So, imaging is important, pictures are useful. So, let me start with this case. This is a case that we encountered at the London 2012 Olympic Games, and this is a 110 meter hurdler. Uh, he was in a gold medal prospect, he was in the race, he qualified for the finals, starts the race, and then suddenly crashes to the ground, holding onto his ankle. Now, I remember. Now, the beauty of the games was we had the polyclinic right, right next to the athlete's uh, village and right next to where the competitions were being held. So uh, I remember still even the commentators were giving, the, giving their own medical opinion and differential diagnosis of what it could be. Whilst the replays were being shown on the television, this patient gets brought into the polyclinic and he was sitting outside the, the x-ray suite. So, we did an x-ray uh, just to make sure there was no stress fracture, and this is what we saw. So I hope it's projecting well. You see a slither of a linear uh, bone fragment there, and what do you think is the diagnosis? Avulsion fracture. Avulsion fracture. Now, you can see there's a small defect there, and you can see uh, there's a cortical avulsion fracture from the calcaneal tuberosity, suggesting uh, Achilles tendon avulsion. So we did an ultrasound scan. And uh, you can quite clearly see that the Achilles tendon is completely avulsed. You can see the avulsed bone fragment, it's uh, uh, retracted proximally. So uh, uh, there's a, the foot and ankle orthopedic surgeon came, which presented the imaging, and he wanted to get an MRI scan, as they always do. Uh, well, fair enough. I mean, you got, you had two scanners, a 1.5 and 3 test, and we had to use them. So we obviously put the patient in the scanner, and quite clearly you can see some uh, edema uh, where the uh, the bone fragment has been evolved, and you can see the tendon completely uh, retracted. Now, this is an interesting case because it's very unusual to get this type of an injury in a young fit athlete. This is the kind of injury that you see in uh, patients with rheumatoid arthritis, inflammatory arthropathies, osteomalacia, so on and so forth. Now, why would a young, fit, healthy athlete get such type of an injury? Now, the explanation that was offered was because it's a 110 meter hurdler, they try to increase their agility by cutting down on the BMI. Obviously, it makes them more agile and uh, increases their speed, and this can lead to nutrition compromise and can result in reduced bone mineral density. And you can, you can actually see these kind of injuries in young, fit professional athletes. Now, that's one thing to say. For you know, obviously these athletes, they have recurring problems and they can have uh, numerous interventional therapies over the years. And uh, of course this patient could have had uh, use of corticosteroid or whatnot that resulted in regional osteopenia and resulted in this type of an injury. Now I'm going to show you a small video. Uh, this is again uh, from the <coughs> video, I think. This was from the Rio Olympics and uh, this chap basically uh, is an overhead. And then look at what happens during the overhead lift. So, uh, very similar injury that we saw. This is a different athlete. Obviously, you can't show the same uh, imaging for this, uh, for this athlete because uh, of patient confidentiality. But very similar mechanism of injury uh, in a different athlete, overhead lift, 
uh, valgus injury to the elbow, and basically there was no, quite clear to see that the elbow joint is frankly dislocated. And if you look on these images, you can quite clearly see that the medial and lateral uh, ligaments have been uh, completely destroyed, and you can see what you can see, that's the posterior bundle of your uh, lateral ligament. Uh, you can see the osborn fascia, which is the flexor carpe uh, ulnaris retinaculum, which forms the roof of the cubital tunnel, and in that structure you can see the ulna now completely sublost. And that's the radial collateral ligament laterally, and the lateral of the lateral ligament is also gone. And basically, flag rupture of both medial and lateral ligament complex. Now this is, I promise you, this is the last imaging case I'm going to show before I start looking into the future, because you've got to trust me. Um, so this is an athlete, again, a 21-year-old male, long-distance athlete, 10,000 meter runner, came in with, uh, with mid-tibial pain, they did an MRI scan, this was an Olympic level athlete as well, you can see uh, the periosteal reaction, you can see the periosteitis uh, edema there, and you can see some intramedullary bone marrow edema as well. Now when you see this, when you see intramedullary edema, alarm bells should ring. Now this is a high grade bone stress response. Now this for all practical purposes is a stress fracture. So basically this guy is a 10k runner and uh, we've asked him not to run basically. Said so uh, can't run obviously you're going to fracture. What you see in professional athletes is these guys have been training for what is once in a lifetime opportunity so they take the risk. As long as it's an informed choice, this athlete decided to go and compete. And uh, again, you know, I don't think it's been a few uh, hundreds of meters. And um, I mean, that's the CT actually. We did the CT as well. Once again, shows the periosteal reaction there. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's got a stress response because clearly there was no fracture line, identifiable fracture line at that stage. But you know, we did uh, inform the athlete that this was obviously going to progress. So he comes back, and all we had to do was an x-ray, basically, to show that he's developed a frag fracture. So, now the point I'm trying to make is, uh, these athletes are high-profile athletes, and, uh, you know, some of them get paid quite a lot, like, uh, you know, uh, Paris Saint-Germain, who spent a fortune getting Mbappe and uh, Neymar Jr. I mean, when, they get, when they're kind of paying these amounts, it's important to get the diagnosis. I mean, these, uh, it's important, it's just, not only the safety of the athletes, the clubs are very, I mean, the reality of sports medicine is, is the clubs are proactive and want to make sure that their athletes are in top form. So early diagnosis is the key. Now, this is already happening, so what most professional sports clubs are doing, they're having their own imaging units. But they don't have to come to a hospital. You could be, I mean, this is the scanner from uh, in Manchester United. So you could have an on-field injury, <coughs> an athlete, Basically, I mean, you suspect the physio, there's a quick all pitch side physio assessment of the team doctor, whoever assists the athlete, and uh, you need to make a decision whether they can go back in or, you know, if they have to uh, stay out for the rest of the match or if they are uh, playing for the rest of the season, what's the rehabilitation period like. So straight away, I mean, now what tends to happen is they come and have an MRI scan straight away after the injury, especially for kind of suspected muscle strain injuries or uh, in ligament injuries, ACL, safety and health sport Now you see, you'll see this happening more and more, so wouldn't be surprised, uh, maybe not for cricket, most of the uh, football clubs, uh, the AD clubs, they are actually getting their own imaging suites and MRI scanners. Now portable ultrasound, this is uh, something that's coming into fashion. Now you can actually have a handheld device that can be connected uh, by Wi-Fi to your uh, smartphones and you can actually scan athletes. I mean, this is as portable as it gets, really. I mean, it's almost like a stethoscope. Now you can, what you can expect to see in future, it's already happening, is most of the medical uh, professionals dealing with athletes will be trained <coughs> to use these devices. So basically, there's a lot of pitch side ultrasound going on for an early and quick diagnosis. And this is already happening, but you can see, uh, you can expect to see more, more of this uh, going into the future. <coughs> I'm going to talk about uh, the applications of imaging and uh, you know we see a lot of 4D, 3D, 4D imaging. I mean most at the moment uh, we see a lot of antenatal scans being done. I mean all these fancy scans trying to look at the baby's face whilst uh, still in the womb. Now this is being extrapolated uh, to uh, imaging of professional sports injuries as well and uh, 
got an example of an Achilles tendon, and what it does is it basically maps the coordinates of a 2D image and produces a 3D image of what the tendon is like. Now, the interesting thing is you don't need a formal training to be able to do the scan, but if you're not trained, you press a button and you get a 4D image and you'd be able to look at the morphology of the structure of the tendon itself. Somebody is suspecting an Achilles tendon rupture, obviously, you'd be able to make the tag without any formal training. Now, functional ultrasound, now this is uh, the sonoelastography. This is uh, becoming more and more popular. We used to do the 2D ultrasound with Doppler functionality. I mean, quite clearly, you can see that the Achilles tendon is inflamed. It's very tendinopathic. But uh, you do the sonoelastography. What it does is uh, it basically gives uh, color in the tendon. And then this red area is actually the area of active tendinopathy. And uh, that is where the tendon has softened. So, more and more, ultrasound is not going to be just 2D ultrasound. So as we go into the future, we'll see that we want to look at the tensile strength of the tendon. We want to see the intrinsic degeneration. We just don't want to rely on the morphology and the vascularity to assess the extent of tendon damage. We want to be looking at the, um, the mechanical strength of the tendon. And uh, uh, so the last topography is becoming more and more popular in this regard. Now, a few clinics in London have this. You have an orthopedic consulting room, or you could have a sports physician sitting in assessing uh, the athlete, and next door you got a portable MRI scanner. So you send them next door, and they get the images, and straight away in five minutes' time you're back at the, with, the, with the clinician discussing your findings. So like a peripheral extremity, maybe, I, mean, I, I think this is a knee, uh, it's a far pitch to, uh, this, I haven't seen this in any of our local clinics, but uh, we get this 0.5 test length. Uh, 0.2 Tesla, the peripheral extremity is looking for scapegoat fractures and whatnot. So this is coming into future, and you can expect to see more and more of this going into future. Now, functional MRI. I mean, this is uh, this is uh, becoming more more and more uh, common as well. What you can see, actually, when you see the uh, the conventional MRI, uh, you don't see any intrinsic cartilage changes until there is a bond or fissuring or uh, a partial thickness or a full thickness cartilage loss. Now we're doing a T2 mapping of this cartilage and uh, you'll be able to see early intrinsic degeneration within the tendon and you tend to pick this up uh, at a very early stage. And we did talk about um, the athletes and uh, most of these athletes actually uh, during the window period they tend to have a whole body MR uh, just to make sure that they are not got any significant damage that would prevent them from playing for the rest of the season. So at the moment it's all conventional MRI but you can see that this will become more and more common looking at the cartilage status, which will decide on how much the club's going to invest. So uh, you know, this is something that might happen more and more probably. Now sodium imaging, you measure the sodium signal, and this is normal signal, and you can see in a degenerate cartilage. You wouldn't be able to see it on a conventional MRI, but if you do the sodium imaging, you can quite clearly see there is a signal dropout suggesting that there is a degeneration within that cartilage. And uh, we're also using this for uh, looking at muscle injuries, and uh, uh, quite clearly you can see there's increased signal uh, within the stress muscle on heavily T2 weighted imaging, and uh, you can see the MR elastography. This is an athlete uh, who had uh, uh, who was made to exercise, and he, he had the symptoms, and he did the MR elastography. Whereas the normal MRI scan did show did pick up any signal changes. On the elastography, we did begin to pick up uh, signal changes. Uh, and uh, that is uh, the muscle fatigue and changes with the muscle at a very microscopic level. So again, whole body MRI, we did talk about this. This is what they get. They basically get the whole body MRI, including peripheral extremities, looking at their hamstrings and whatnot. Uh, uh, these are professional athletes uh, before, uh, uh, before they are bought with the clubs. But you can see that the functional MRI component is going to become more rampant as we go into the future. CT, this is a case that we encountered recently as a professional athlete who presented <coughs> with low back pain and uh, did a CT scan quite clearly. You can see multiple uh, parts fractures. You can see a complete fracture here and you can see uh, an incomplete fracture a little higher up. Now sometimes when most of these athletes would have had parts fractures of varying ages at different stages and it's hard to identify when they've happened and which one is a symptomatic one. We did a uh, spec CT and quite clearly see it's actually not this one, this is a chronic old fracture. There's no metabolic activity there, but higher up you can see uh, there's increased metabolic activity, which suggests that's the action, that's the one you need to target and treat. 
because that's the one which is actually causing symptoms. So this is becoming more and more common, but the holy grail in CT is really the dose reduction techniques that we're working on, and this is something that we'll see more of in the future. So <coughs> imaging can be interpreted to a certain extent, and in fact, we still need radiologists, keeps us in the job, and now sometimes you need a professional opinion to look at some imaging and uh, get the report. So uh, uh, what we're seeing more frequently is the PAX mail. Yeah, the images are being emailed, and I've had a, uh, I've had a radiologist, uh, uh, eminent radiologist, who's come from uh, Melbourne for a conference, and basically he had the images being sent from his clinic on his iPhone, and he was looking through the iPhone and you know sending back the reports. And uh, I mean, I don't know if we can uh, get away with that in the, in the UK, but uh, certainly I mean, this is, th these kind of possibilities are being explored, where you have hot reporting lights, where the images are basically emailed across getting instantaneous reports. So I'm going to briefly touch on the phone apps before I finish. And uh, I try to look up, uh, because uh, I'm really not an apps person. I'll be very honest with you. Uh, you know, when I was asked to look into these phone apps and then uh, for sports medicine, I was really wasn't aware of any, because I have to put my hand up and say I don't use them. In fact, uh, last night I was selling deputously, and I got a call to say, oh, your WhatsApp is it. Anyway, <laughs> I, I, I consulted my best friend. <laughs> consulted my best friend Google, and I looked at some uh, WhatsApp. But there are numerous, numerous, tons of those uh, sports medicine phone apps. I found this interesting article. They looked at the phone apps in sports medicine, and uh, this was a going a couple of years ago. They identified. They looked at 76 apps. 59% were medical. 37% were health and fitness, which had some kind of a sports medicine slant to it. 64% were free. And what was more interesting, and the reason why this caught my eye was 39% had no name medical professional. Basically, I mean, the danger is what goes into these apps and what kind of information that's being fed into these apps, and that's something that we need to be careful about. And um, the team also went on to look at the top 10 most uh, viewed apps or uh, subscribed apps. Optic Live is basically tells you how to do an orthopedic surgery. Let me show you some techniques. So you can see that in the wrong hands, you know, this can be, uh, this can be misused. But uh, then there's a meniscal tear, which tells you what a meniscal tear is, the rehabilitation. ACL app tells you, you should fix you right without having to go to surgery, basically. It tells you all the rehab exercises and you'll be perfect. But I uh, uh, don't know how far I mean, I would take that with a pinch of salt. Uh, you, you know, uh, we had this uh, lovely talk uh, from Mr. Allen this morning, and I'm sure he's not going to a native guy because uh, uh, you know I, the, the point I'm trying to make is you get numerous apps but uh, it's a regulation of the content and uh, you know, it's the accountability of what is being put into it and it's the evidence base of the information that's going into the apps that we need to have a greater look at so there's a danger yes they are good from reliable sources but the apps can make a big difference uh, to patients to clinicians we can incorporate technology uh, to be able to use it for better clinical diagnosis. Like, for example, the one thing I use is uh, the British Athletic Association classification system when I create my muscle tears. I have a picture of that on my phone. That's as far as I go. I mean, it's not a formal app, but I go on article because I can't keep going in back and forth. So I have a picture on my phone and I refer to it. So we do like to use technology to varying degrees in our clinical practice but obviously we need to make sure that the content is regulated and uh, it's evidence-based because at the end of the day, it's a patient or other who would be uh, the beneficiary or intended beneficiary from this, so we want to be careful. So in summary, I hope I've managed to uh, convey to you three important points, three take-home points. Imaging is important, yes, but not more important, as important as uh, clinical evaluation, and it's changing all the time, and there are uh, a lot of new applications coming in sports, the portable imaging applications, uh, they, they are picking up in a big way. And um, uh, the third thing is, technology is useful, especially when it comes to smartphone apps. We need to be careful what we'll be using. Uh, content regulation is very important. So those are my take home points, and I'm happy to take any questions if you have any quick ones. You can see all of Those are the guys are coming in, so which means. <laughs> have I got time for questions or yeah, we have, if they have any burning questions they can just ask. please any questions 
we all want food, so we just want to <laughs> 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 <laughs>